Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <coughs> Paul Angus from Shape Blue. Uh, I think some of you are probably pretty, uh, you could do these bits of the presentation yourself. You, you've seen what I've been saying so much. Um, <coughs> so, we'll, we'll, I'm going to be talking about cloud stack networking. As I say, most of you have probably seen these slides already a few times. So I'm a cloud architect with Shape Blue. <coughs> Been working since with CloudStack since uh, Citrix uh, bought it initially before we got uh, open source to Apache. I specialize in actually deploying CloudStack into uh, environments, doing the design with the companies, um, <clears throat> and uh, getting it in there, getting it working with their environment, and then with their tooling that they want to use after that, helping them to get the most out of CloudStack. Um, so I view CloudStack, as I say here, from the uh, Practically, what can we do with it? So from the user, the end user point of view, the person who's going to be using the API in the end, um, those consumers of this cloud, what do they need CloudStack to do? <coughs> A quick bit about Shape Blue. Uh, this, and what I take from this is, this is what our day job is. So this is what we do day in, day out. So <coughs> it's important to us, obviously, to be able to uh, uh, know what we're talking about, hopefully. Um, and this gives you an idea of the kind of customers that we're talking about. Now, this is uh, CloudStack networking. As you'll see from the slides down in the bottom corner, it says CloudStack Guru. So usually, uh, Jeff Higginbottom, who's ShapeBlue's CTO, uh, is always giving a networking talk somewhere in the world at some point. But he's had a, a baby girl, so he wasn't able to do it here today. So I'm, if you like, standing in from him, editing a little bit, and then uh, doing it in my own style. <coughs> So we kind of start with uh, why networking at a service. And what we've got is the fact that rather than have some static uh, linking of uh, our VPS instances to the web, which people then can connect to, we've got uh, the ability to keep recreating, moving around and changing the networks that people are using. Obviously, we've built that on pretty static networks in the first place, uh, ignoring the SDN technologies. We've already but we've already built a, a, a layer there. But in terms of the end user, what they see is a network they can configure in any way they like, pretty much. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I always think that stuff like this should be at the start of the conference to get people up to speed if they need to, and then we kind of go more in advance. But uh, we're doing this one the other way around. <clears throat> but sometimes you find that people have been listening to a lot of really in-depth talks and wondering kind of what they need the gaps filled in from the start of what is it you're talking about in the first place. So <clears throat> for CloudStack, we have two logical network models, pretty much. We have our basic networking and our advanced networking. Our basic networking gives us our AWS-style layer three isolation, which makes a massive scale because our security is distributed um, much easier. Uh, once you get to VLANs, we know we have limitations on the number of VLANs we can physically have. And for service providers, that can become a problem. Uh, there are not many enterprises that are limited by the fact there's only 4,096 VLANs they can have, but um, certainly service providers, that can be a real issue. So we end up with uh, simple flat networks and each pod having its own CEDA, and I come into more detail on that in a bit. And then optionally, we can use guest isolation through security groups, or we could just create virtual machines in our environment if you just want the ability to create virtual machines without the uh, security around them. And then uh, using a Netscaler, we can bring in elastic IP, elastic load balancing. Um, so we'll see later that in a basic network, we don't have the idea of a public network as such, so you don't have any natting, that kind of thing. And optionally as well, we can use uh, NICERA as well as a way of linking things together, even in a basic network. <clears throat> so a bit of an explanation of what we need to do with security groups. What they're doing is isolating the traffic between virtual machines. So where with VLANs and ACLs, you're isolating uh, networks so that communication has to go through a router which has ACLs on it. Here, we're actually at the hypervisor la layer <clears throat> stopping virtual machines from being able to talk to each other. Even if they're on the same network and even if they're on the same hypervisor, we can control what they can and can't connect to. Um, an important concept to get around with a security group 
is that it's more of an OU than a, a group. It doesn't mean because two virtual machines are in the same security group, they can talk to each other. What it means is if they're in the same security group, they have the same uh, egress and ingress rules applied to each other. So that's the first gotcha people come up with. They put things in the same security group and then say, hang on, why can't these talk to each other? It's because you've got to open the particular ports and apply it to the security group that those are in. And obviously, it's a two-way thing. So if you allow egress on, let's say, port 22 between virtual machines, you still won't get to the other virtual machine because you haven't allowed ingress. So you've got to remember there's two sides to that communication. <coughs> uh, in Zen Server, we have to switch to using the Linux bridge. Uh, by default now, it uses Open vSwitch, uh, which currently doesn't support security groups. So there's a, a little bit of work you have to do on the Zen Server configuration first to enable the use of security groups. Uh, KVM, by default, uses Linux bridge stack, so that's OK. Uh, VMware doesn't support basic network or doesn't support security groups at all. You still use a basic network, but you'll have no isolation between the virtual machines. And so to give you an idea of where we talk about security groups and the rules, here's just a visual of the UI um, and how you'd create a rule that allowed egress and ingress rules, <coughs> egress or ingress rules, and how you can either uh, look at it from a CEDA if you were coming from an external network, which was being routed internally through your infrastructure, or from other accounts or security groups, so you can actually allow access between your accounts. So you might want to create different accounts to get separation, um, separation of people's uh, VMs and what they can see, but then still allow them to communicate by opening your security group rules. Uh, advanced networking say so provides a lot more functionality. Uh, the reason for that is because suddenly we've put a virtual router in the mix. Because we're uh, natting our internal network, we go through a virtual router to get out to our public network. Um, that means if you're going through this virtual router, why not take advantage of it? Why not put other services on there as you go through? Either from uh, your kind of source that from your virtual machine out, or more likely from your public network in. So <clears throat> we can then put firewall rules on that. We can put uh, load balancing. Uh, we'll talk about VPC in a bit, uh, uh, quite a bit. But also, um, uh, so called firewall VPC uh, load balancing. Uh, there's a lot of features there we can use. And then we've added in uh, new SDN technologies as well to get around the VLAN limitations. But as I said earlier, uh, with VLANs, obviously, we're separating networks from each other, not necessarily virtual machines from each other. So. Um, that's kind of our, our difference there. We can actually create uh, shared guest networks, and they can be shared between accounts, uh, domains, or even across an entire zone. Uh, use cases for that kind of thing may be uh, service providers wanting to provide uh, a management layer across their networks. So they'll have uh, clients that have created lots of networks of their own, but you want a, a shared network that goes across all of them, uh, which you'll provide your monitoring or your backup solutions or that kind of stuff through. Um, and if you're in a uh, kind of reseller model, you might give a reseller a domain and they would want the shared network just across their domain. Obviously, they wouldn't want it across the entire zone with everyone else's um, VM. So you then just create that across that domain. But obviously, now we've got a virtual router and everything's natted, uh, we can have multiple uh, physical networks viewing multiple networks, and we can have everyone in their isolated natted networks. And <clears throat> the advanced network also give us the ability to have multiple physical guest networks. Uh, the most, uh, sort of the use case I've seen for that recently was if you're creating virtual machines in Linux and you want to mount iSCSI LUNs for shared storage, all of that traffic is going over the guest network, even though it's a storage type traffic. So if these virtual machines get busy, it's going to use a lot of uh, your guest network traffic up. And you might have thought, actually, there's not a lot of traffic going to be on the guest network, so I don't need much bandwidth. By adding in a separate guest network, which can be used uh, as an extra NIC on these virtual machines, and the iSCSI goes through that to their, their storage, suddenly you've, you've separated that traffic out. So um, 
you have to kind of get your head around why you might use the guess. Yeah? So the question was, is that in the VPC scenario? The VPC scenario adds in other features. It's not specifically talking about that, but you can use it in a VPC. So the question, well, it was asking for clarification. Yes, yeah, so you physically are going to have different pair, or different ex, uh, interfaces coming out of your host. So you allow the hypervisor to have another guest network physically coming out. So you're physically separating these guest networks rather than just separating them by VLAN. So allowing you to have maybe very noisy traffic not affect this other guest network. Uh, as I say, because we've got a virtual router, uh, that allows us to bring in a whole new load of features, the firewalls, the client VPN, load balancing, the uh, source static, natting, uh, and port forwarding. We do have a, a twist on all of this, which is the advanced networking with security groups. So a uh, use case I talked about earlier today was uh, with a client who basically didn't like the idea of all their traffic running through single virtual routers coming into any given network. Uh, they were thinking of tens of thousands of tran um, transactions per second going through this network, and they didn't like the idea of that all going through a virtual router. So by using, they could get the separation of VLANs, but still use security groups to get the multiple tiers into their, uh, into their networking model. So we've got uh, four types of network in CloudStack that we can talk about. First of all, we have the management network. Uh, it pretty much does what it says on the tin. It's connecting all your various components together. Uh, we've drawn the MySQL in there. More often than not, that sits on the management network as well, but it, it doesn't have to as long as it can talk to the management server. But generally, your system VMs and your uh, storage and the hosts are all going to be on that management network so they can be controlled and can communicate back. Uh, now we split a bit because we've got guest networks and in advanced and basic networks. So on the left, we've got the basic network. Um, I put in layer three gateway there because that doesn't mean you can't get to the internet. It doesn't mean you can't get out to uh, the public internet at large or somewhere else. Um, for some companies, they would use that layer three gateway and then connect into their internal resource. Um, but that layer three gateway could have routes to get out to the public internet as well. There's no reason why it can't. Uh, you just don't have any firewalling capability that is under the control of CloudStack in this case. So CloudStack isn't controlling that layer three gateway. That's outside of its control. But um, yep. Previous one. I don't know what asterisk is there. Um, I think it's probably because it's secondary storage rather than just, it uh, doesn't include primary storage. Yeah, I'll come, come on to that. But you're, um, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, we should, we'll look at that in a sec. Um, in advanced networking, obviously we've said we've got the virtual router and this will look something like that. We normally expect to see the, vir the public, as we call it, internet pipe straight into the virtual router so it can pick up IP addresses. Uh, in reality, although this says www, it doesn't have to be the public internet. There's no reason why that can't be the corporate network on the other end of that virtual router. Uh, there's no reason why in an in a enterprise that has to go out to the internet. That could just be somewhere outside a cloud stack. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, if you want to have um, effectively uh, natting, 
going on. You can do that in a basic network, but you have to use a NetScaler. So a NetScaler can provide, basically, it can be that layer three gateway that I talked of. That's the only type of layer three gateway CloudStack can actually manage. So uh, if we replace the nominal layer three gateway with a NetScaler, we can suddenly actually start controlling that and uh, give us uh, a more advanced type network in that kind of zone. So onto the public network. Just a, a jump ahead again. So in a public network, as I say, um, in a basic zone, that's the only time you can have a public network is if you have a net scaler. Otherwise, CloudStack has no concept of a public network in a guess in a basic network. In an advanced network, um, it's basically anything north of the virtual router. Uh, say that doesn't have to be the um, public internet. That can be local. Guys who've done boot camps with us, we, we cheat and make whatever network we're on the public network, whether that has access to the internet at large or not, um, because it doesn't have to be the internet. And then we have our, our system VMs. They're going to talk on that public network as well. Uh, they're going to expect to be able to pick up a public IP address. Uh, so if you see the, so from the boot camps, we've done, always done those for the purposes of doing a demonstration. They've been on the local LAN that we've been sitting on, or even a host-only network inside VirtualBox. So there's no reason why it has to be the internet, but it certainly is something north of the virtual router, um, something where everything else is outside of CloudStack's control. Um, I may note there that obviously the virtual routers don't have a public network connection if you're in a basic network. Uh, and then we have the storage network. As you say, that's optional. Uh, the confusion we get is that just means for secondary storage. Um, it, could be, it could have been better named. It's caused a lot of people a lot of confusion over the years. Um, using the storage network just means your secondary storage. Uh, in terms of primary storage, uh, CloudStack is just assuming the hosts can communicate with it. It's really not bothered about how it does that. So that could be on different interfaces. It could be over anything you like. Uh, CloudStack just assumes it's there and it works. Let's bring all these in. So in terms of the kind of connectivity we'd roughly expect to see, as you can see from the diagram where I've shown the primary storage, or where we show the primary storage, and the hosts, that's the connection has to be there between the primary storage and the hosts. Uh, but the management server doesn't have to go anywhere near the primary storage. And obviously, in each of the pods or however you've split up your storage, they don't have to be able to communicate with each other either. Um, when CloudStack is doing some migration between um, storage pools, uh, primary storage pools, it actually uses the secondary storage. It uploads it to the secondary storage, moves it across, and then downloads it from the secondary storage to this other primary storage pool. So it uses that as a bridge. So the primary storage pools don't need to have communication with each other either. Um, and up the top, we've got basically our management server, MySQL. Our users and admins coming in, usually through a firewall to get to the management server UI or API. Um, we still have our secondary storage attached there. And then we've got the pods and our public traffic going through some kind of route when the user's coming in that way. Uh, usually not firewalled uh, in a public cloud because they're going to want to do whatever they want, uh, which scares people. Uh, enterprise, that probably still is firewalled off. This is where it will get interesting. So in a basic zone, what we do is we have our, our pod. Our pod's going to be in, in a seeder that we've created, a subnet created for it. And then within that, or on top of that, we're going to create a tell CloudStack about a guest network that exists. And we're going to create um, that in our layer three switch. So our layer three switch that these um, guest VMs are going to talk through, it's going to be uh, have a gateway on the switch at the top. We then create another pod. That's going to have its own subnet. 
for the management side of it. So this is where it's very scalable because we can just keep adding these pods with their own seeders. We don't have to have created a massive seeder in the first place. We can just keep adding chunks at a time. But the same thing will happen with our guests. Uh, because what we will do is create a guest seeder for pod one and a guest seeder for pod two, they will both have gateways that we'll create on the layer three switches at the top of the stack. So to communicate between a virtual machine in pod one and a virtual machine in pod two, for instance, we'll take uh, 172.16.02 and it wants to connect to 172.16.2.2, it's basically going to use those gateways that we've created in the infrastructure to then get across to the pod it needs to get to. So that's how we get the guest networking to work, and that's why it's so scalable is because we keep creating small guest seeders. We don't have big uh, broadcast domains. We just keep creating these, and we can have tens, thousands of these things um, quite easily. And this is why Amazon is, was built this way. So this is the way Amazon is built to, to enable them to connect you up. And then they use net scalers by the skip load to give you a public network. Fine enough, although uh, advanced network looks more complicated, it's actually generally simpler to set up in the first place. Um, so uh, once you get into uh, advanced networking, you're really down into just the realms of normal VLANs. And so CloudStack is um, orchestrating the creation of those VLANs on the hypervisors. Uh, you've created the whole range of VLANs you want in your switches, uh, and then traffic flows as you would normally expect in a virtualized environment. So if I've created a VLAN, I put a virtual machine on that VLAN in one host. I put a virtual machine in a, that same VLAN on another host. Because my networks are trunked together, my guest networks are trunked together, then that VLAN enables the two virtual machines to just talk to each other um, uh, normally. So there's no kind of nothing new and exciting in that. So we did a lot of work with uh, service, network service providers. We wanted to, uh, if you like, abstract out how the networks worked um, to make it easier to change networking functions and to add them in. Uh, so we started off with pretty much the virtual router. Uh, and then I think we added the NetScaler and the F5 and the Juniper SRX. And then the kind of list is growing and accelerating at the speed it's growing. Um, so we have all these new features that are coming in. So the star is obviously new in the latest version. So you can see quite a lot's being, ad being added all the time. So, but as I say, what we're doing is abstracting out these things. We create a service provider in CloudStack and then enable us to then use it to do our networking. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the virtual private clouds. Uh, listening to remember it might have been deep, um last year. The way virtual private clouds uh, came about is that it's basically using the same idea of, as traditional data centers of having multi-tiered networks. So we could do a kind of multi-tiered network with the original virtual router, but it was very messy because we had lots of virtual routers all over the place, and uh, you couldn't have really ACLs between them easily. It was quite messy. So having this uh, in the same vein as that Amazon gives us the idea of uh, web data app tier kind of topology. Um, so we've got the multi-tier networks. We now have the ACLs between them like you would have in a more traditional data center. Uh, we've added in new features like the site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, we have a private gateway, which we'll look at in a bit as well. Uh, we've now added a VPC to a VPC VPN, so you can connect up multiple VPCs uh, and use a VPN. Now, what happened is we had the original virtual router, and then someone figured out that it would be good to have this multi-tiered networking model, and so that was created as VPC. But initially, that was pretty much all it did, so we still had to keep the virtual router as it was. Over time, uh, all of the features that are in the virtual router are being uh, written into the virtual private cloud router, the VPC router, and given time, we'll then be able to just kill off the original virtual router and you'll just use the virtual 
fiber cloud router, there'll be, there'll be no use for the other one. Um, from um, what Chirudit was saying, is pretty much we're more or less there now. You've got to have a very specific use case. You've got to have something very odd to, um, to want to still use the virtual router over the VPC because you've got so much more um, flexibility with that. So here's a kind of just diagrammatic view of what it's saying. You've got your three tiers. Um, now, one thing that does do is it does chew up VLANs. As you can see, if you start allowing users to just keep creating um, tiers, then they're going to go through the VLANs you've got very quickly. Um, another reason for moving to, to SDN. <coughs> uh, the, obviously, the traditional use is to have a, a web app and data tier are the, are the most obvious kind of thing that people look for. So we have um, the usual public gateway that's always been there, uh, that the VPC, uh, the virtual router has been to get out to the internet or public internet. But we also added in uh, a site-to-site -site VPN. So um, it's an IPsec tunnel. So mo pretty much anything you can configure granularly enough to work with the um, uh, virtual router IPsec configuration uh, will work. With I think it's only been tested on a certain number of physical uh, devices so far at the other end. That's in the cloud stack documentation, that's there. That's not to say it won't work on others. It's just not been done. It hasn't been documented. Um, I think someone was telling me that they have the documentation. They were going to share it with someone else on a boot camp that we did of the actual configuration for Cisco ASA, I think it was, so that they'd got it working stably. Um, but it was hard work trying to find all the little um, configurations that you needed to get right. But then today, it's just an IPsec VPN. Uh, and also, obviously, uh, we just recently added back in, as I say, it used to be in the virtual router before, and now it's in the VPC as well, a user VPN. So from your laptop, PC, or whatever, you can connect in over uh, that kind of well, my VPN. We have the option of doing VPC to VPC over the public gateways. So we go out through our public gateways uh, and connect up our VPCs that way. So they could be in different zones, they could be in different regions, uh, they could be in the same data center, uh, but you now can, can link those up and start using those uh, to connect your different networks together. Now we added in the idea of a private gateway now, this has to be connect, created by the root admin. So a user can't create this private gateway because it is a gateway into the back-end infrastructure and through the back-end infrastructure. So you have to know what the back-end infrastructure is, what the next hops will be, um, and then because you already have your original gateway, that's the public gateway, you're then going to need uh, static routes probably on your... Um, on your VMs to know which gateway you're going to use because this does have a different IP address. So it's not sharing uh, the public IP address and then rerouting traffic. It's actually delivering a different IP address. But there are a number of use cases for this. It could be uh, through your infrastructure. You want to connect to a remote um, data center. Or it could be you've got legacy physical equipment in another part of the data center that you want to link into this this uh, virtual network you've created. Uh, we've actually no clients that want to use it that way. Um, from the telcos, you can link that directly into the MPLS on the back. So you VLAN that straight through to an MPLS to connect a client, uh, client site directly to their, their um, VPC in your cloud. And then, because we can we can actually also connect them VPC to VPC through that private gateway as well. So we've got a number of ways we can use that private gateway that's um, very, uh, very useful. Let's bring these up because I'll have to talk through them a little bit. So here's to give you an idea. There's uh, various documentation around um, Citrix and CloudStack about the communication ports and what talks to what. Um, you can see it's quite, there's quite a lot going on. Uh, if you're lucky and you're building from a, a pretty um, greenfield site, you might get away with getting rid of, having 
fairly flat. But uh, I've worked with environments where everything has been on its own VLAN, uh, so it's been a seven-tier network. Everything had to, we had to know the, fire, the ports we need to open for every bit of communication between everything and everything. So something like this then gets you to what port you're going to need to open to get things to work. Um, so the, the kind of major ones is talking down to the hypervisors. You're going to talk over 22 to KVM. Uh, I think 22 to Zen server, is either when it's talking to a system VM or uh, when it's copying scripts. Uh, 443 to your vCenter. Uh, an important thing to notice here is that you're talking to the vCenter rather than the ESXi hosts for this, for this, this management layer. Um, other ones that are worthy or know is 8250. Often gets forgotten. Uh, that's for your system VMs uh, and hosts to talk to the Cloud Stack management server. So you've got to remember they talk back. They don't talk back over the same port. So 8250 is, a, is one that gets a, kind of ignored and forgotten, particularly when you're load balancing. You've got to pay attention to, to that one so that you're not bombarding one server with all of the, uh, all the traffic from your hosts. Uh, and the other quiet one that gets forgotten is 9090 because that's how the two cloud stack management servers talk to each other. So that's how they uh, make sure they know they're both alive and, and do their heart beating. And so if they can't communicate with each other, uh, if you've got ones in different data centers, you've got to watch, look for that port as well. Okay, I think that's pretty much the time. So um, are there any questions on that? I know you guys have some will add some. I know it's end of a long week. No? Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone.